Hey everyone, my name is Derek Schrank and I'm a student here at SUNY Geneseo. As students of public speaking, it's important that you understand the three major types of speeches that we'll cover in this class. To recall, those are the memorized, the manuscript, and as we'll talk about in this podcast lesson, the extemporaneous. Today we're going to look at just what exactly an extemporaneous speech is, and later on in the video, I'll give you some tips on how to deliver them with perfection. Without any further ado, let's get started. All right, so if you do a brief Google search of what an extemporaneous speech is, you'll probably get an answer, something like a speech done with little to no preparation. And while that definition is sort of true, it definitely isn't the case for this class. In fact, an extemporaneous speech actually involves a great deal of preparation and rehearsal, much like the other two types of speeches that we'll cover in this class. So just what is an extemporaneous speech then? Well, the answer really lies somewhere between the manuscript and the memorized. You see, the extemporaneous speech isn't memorized in the way a true memorized speech would be, nor is it recited verbatim from a piece of paper in an essay format like the manuscript. The extemporaneous speech, rather, is one in which the orator uses a well-prepared speech outline, which we'll talk about later, as well as cue cards, which help the speaker know when and what to say during the speech. So the major differentiating factor of the extemporaneous speech is really how it's prepared and delivered. So with all of that said, let's take a look at some of the major components of the extemporaneous speech so that you can see how it all comes together. All right, so at the cornerstone of every extemporaneous speech is the speech outline. And the outline sort of acts as a roadmap for the speech, basically directing where it will go next and having all of the information you plan to talk about during your speech. It's important to note that outlines are full sentences and they contain all of the content that you plan on covering. During the actual delivery of the speech, however, you may not cover exactly everything in the speech, or perhaps you may add a thing or two in the speech. What's important to remember, however, is the outline has everything you plan on talking about. If you remove a thing or two during the speech, or if you add a thing or two, that's fine. That's part of the extemporaneous model. So you can kind of think of it like on the macro level, the outline and the speech are identical, but on the micro, they're not. All right, so with all of that said, let's actually jump onto the computer and take a look at what an outline for an extemporaneous speech looks like so that you can kind of get a better idea. All right, so here we have a look at an actual extemporaneous speech outline. And this is actually coming from my speech of self-introduction from when I took this class um, a few semesters back. Of course, it could be different when you're watching this video. Um, so what I first want to draw your attention to is just how it doesn't look like a, say, manuscript speech or in other words, an essay format. It has a very specific layout and structure, and we'll kind of talk about that in a minute. It's important to remember that outlines aren't meant to be necessarily fully fledged speeches, but don't let that confuse you and make you think that outlines aren't supposed to be everything you plan to say in your speech. What I mean by not fully fledged is that you may add things during the actual delivery. Perhaps it's something that's necessary or relevant to the situation you're in, like, oh, terrible weather we're having. That's a really bad cliche example, but just to show you that sometimes there's things that you'll add that you wouldn't necessarily have in your speech ready to go. On the flip side of that, you may find that because of time or because of the situation, whatever it may be, you may omit things that you originally included in your outline. So keep that in mind as we're taking a look at my speech of self-introduction here. So here we are back again at the speech outline. Notice how the speech is broken down into several parts. Here we have the introduction, weak connection statement, and the central idea. We also have the various supports or evidence that I'm including in this speech. And towards the end, we have a conclusion. These broken down chunks help me conceptualize and really kind of map out where things will go in my speech. You'll also notice how everything is in full sentences, like right here at the top. We've all been told time and time again, and perhaps too much, that we need to just be ourselves. I don't have kind of phrases or just like half a sentence here where I might just try and like, you know, jot down a few things and then I'll fill in the blanks during the actual speech. This is full sentence, full content. Again, a full sentence, full content outline. Also notice how the sentences are broken down by line. Again, back here at the top, we've all been told time and time again, and perhaps too much, that we just need to be ourselves. You may think that this information would all just go on one line, but there's actually a reason why it doesn't. And what it has to do with is how much you can actually say in one breath. How much you can say until you run out of breath and you have to take a breath again because you can't talk anymore and you're out of breath. Like that. 
So if we read this, we've all been told time and time again, take a breath because there's a comma, and perhaps too much, take a breath, that we just need to be ourselves. And so the reason, or the, rather the thinking behind doing that is that it will help you for one thing kind of remember, again, this isn't a memorized speech, but it'll help you kind of remember where things go and what comes next, and also actually help you not have to take too many breaths and make you sound like you're going on and on and on and talking and forgetting how to breathe. All right, so once you've got your outline put together, you've got your central idea in there, your introduction, your support, your conclusion, all of that good stuff, and it's all ready to go. The next step is to create cue cards, and cue cards are just as important as the outline in preparing for your extemporaneous speech. All right, so let's talk about those cue cards. Cue cards, or as you may have heard them referred to before as note cards, essentially guide speakers through the speech. So you make your outline, you get it all fully loaded with your content, but remember, you don't use your outline to deliver the speech, you use cue cards. And the function of them is really to cue you on when to say certain things, what to say, perhaps even where in your location to say certain things. All right, so with that in mind, let's take a look at some things that you may wish to put on your cue cards, as well as some things that you don't want to put on them. Your cue cards should be short and sweet. They shouldn't have loads of information on them. They shouldn't be miniature versions of your speech written in an illegible four-point font and you cram it all into the front and on the back and on the next one. But they also should have helpful information. You don't want it to be something that you just think you might need. Only put stuff on there that you're going to need, stuff that is essential for you to give the speech. All right, so obviously your mouth is important for a speech, right? I mean, how would you give a speech without your mouth? Seems pretty simple. But perhaps less obvious is the importance of your legs. What am I getting at? What I mean is it's important that you make movements during your speech because if you just stay still the whole time without moving, not necessarily bobbing side to side, but without making purposeful movements, you can seem awkward for one thing, but also not well prepared. And really, like you don't have a lot of experience giving speeches. And even if you don't, you kind of want to act like you do. But how do you move? Do you just kind of move back and forth? Do you fidget? Do you just stand there? No, it turns out there's actually a method. Let's talk about it. All right, so as it turns out, there's actually a tried and true method on how to give and make purposeful body movements during your speech. The method's called walk, stop, talk, and it basically follows as the name suggests. And basically, it's a pretty simple principle. You're only going to move during transitions of your speech, meaning that when you're segueing from, say, in the extemporaneous speech, from your introduction to your first main point or your first support, or from your last support to your conclusion, that's when you're gonna move during the actual transition of the speech. And so it may look something like this. All right, so if I had just finished my audience connection statement, so blah, 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 blah. Now I'm ready to transition to my central idea statement. During that transition is when I'm gonna make the movement. So I'm transitioning, I'm saying things that are taking me into that central idea, and now I'm done moving and I'm ready to give my central idea statement. Blah, 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 central idea, blah, blah, blah. Now my central idea statement is done. Now I'm ready to make my next movement to begin my first support or main point. So I'm gonna transition, blah, 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 into main point one, and now I'm gonna stop again, give main point support number one, and then when I'm ready to go to support number two, I'm gonna move somewhere else in the room. Now I'm kind of confined in this space here, but if you have the right space, you'll make a broader movement if need be. Transition, transition, transition. Now support number two, blah, blah, blah. And it goes like that. Another tip beyond walk, stop, talk is to actually take a few steps forward when you're making really important primary points. That may be your central idea statement. That may be the really main point in your support. You may take a step or two forward just for a second, kind of to accentuate the point so that your audience feels that this is really important. Alrighty then, so now that we've gone over how to make purposeful body movements during your speech by following the walk, stop, talk principle, now let's talk about another major component of extemporaneous speech delivery and really any speech delivery, that is vocal mechanics. So we can really break vocal mechanics down into two parts. All right, so the first part of vocal mechanics is something called articulation. And articulation is pretty simple. It basically has to do with how we use our mouths and our vocal cords and everything else that comes with actually producing speech to make words. Now, it's not necessarily about how we pronounce our words, but it more or less is about how well we say them, how well they are received by our audience, the intelligibility of our words. Because if the audience doesn't know what we're saying, then there isn't really much of a speech to be had. All right, the next part of vocal mechanics is actually one that you're probably familiar with. And um, I think like, 
you know, that one. You get what I'm getting at? Vocal fillers, or rather what we would like there to be lack thereof. See, vocal fillers are those things that I was saying just a moment ago. Um, like, you know, yeah, um, I think, uh, things like that where you're between point or between thought and you don't really know what to say next. This tends to happen a lot when we're speaking too fast or when we haven't prepared that well for the speech or usually a combination of the two. If you're speaking too fast and you're going through your points really quickly and then you're like, uh, what comes next? Oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm gonna say next. Of course, you're probably gonna be like, um, I think this. But it, sometimes vocal fillers arise just from natural phenomena or perhaps colloquialisms. For example, like is said an awful lot. And sometimes it might not be that you don't know what to say next. It might just be your natural speaking tendency. So some vocal fillers like like or you know are okay here and there but when you start to say them too much in your speech and they start to become too noticeable that's when it can damage the overall delivery of your speech Alrighty then well in closing if there's anything you walk away with today please remember the key distinctions of the extemporaneous speech and what sets it apart from the other types of speeches that we'll do in this class remember that they fall somewhere between the manuscript and the memorized speech we use outlines to prepare for them and plan them and those outlines are full content they have everything we plan to talk about but during the actual speech we may add a little more we may not mention everything in the speech We'll adapt it to the situation. We also use cue cards to help guide us through the actual speech so we know what to say and when to say it because we don't use the actual outline during the speech. In addition, when we're actually delivering our extemporaneous speech, during our actual speech, we'll be sure to use the walk-stop-talk method so that our movements are purposeful and they're not awkward and we're not staying put and being really fidgety during the speech. We'll also be sure to monitor our vocal mechanics, making sure that we're articulating our words so that our audience knows what we're saying and making sure we're avoiding the use of filler words or vocal fillers like um, you know, like, yeah, things like that. So that's all I have for this podcast lesson. I hope you have a successful year of public speaking and good luck with your adventures in extemporaneous speaking. <laughs>